Good morning. Good morning. It's not Perry Perrins this morning. <laughs> it's um, just me. Just me. Who's Perry Perrins? So, well, we're going to be continuing our series this morning that we started two weeks ago called Twin Tracks. Is my clicker not working? No, it's not working. Oh, no. Sneak preview. Simon introduced this series a couple of weeks ago, and we're looking at how in life we experience these parallel tracks of good and bad, of happiness and sadness, of the highs and lows, of joy and lament. And we're looking in the book of Psalms that reflect these twin tracks really well. Throughout the book, we see uh, the good and the bad of people's lives. And we're looking at what the Psalms has to say on our experience of this Twin Tracks life. Who, who in this room thinks of themselves as a decent quizzer? Who's, who's decent quizzers? Oh, no one's wanting to admit it. I, I'm really, really, really poor at quizzes. I'm the worst person to have on your quiz team. Uh, Chris Heathfield knows that. And um, the only part of a quiz that I like are dingbats. Do you know what I mean by dingbats? Yes. Yeah, so the, these visual word puzzles where you're looking for that well-known saying within the words. So we're going to do a couple now, right? Shout it out when you've got the answer. There's enough of us to get it quite quickly. Right. What's the well-known saying within this? There we go, three musketeers, good. Okay, next one, three musketeers, you get it? Three musket, yeah, three of them, good. Uh, under arrest. You're under arrest, good. Well, this morning, we're going to be looking together at how the Psalms address both the Torah and the Messiah, and how Jesus shines through the narrative of the Psalms. How like these dingbats, when we see the bigger picture of the text, the narrative, rather than placing scrutiny on each individual word, we see that there's a much greater meaning and purpose to the Psalms. We, um, two weeks ago, if you remember when Simon introduced this series, we watched a video, uh, spent a little time watching the Bible Project video that summarises brilliantly the book of Psalms. And I've spoken to many people about it and everyone says those videos are brilliant, but there's so much content in there that it's hard to really get the key aspects from it. So I just want to go again at a few, uh, a little bit of the context of the book of Psalms, a bit of a what is the Psalms. And I'm going to do it in a a lot less knowledgeable way, but hopefully give us a few key things that we can cling on to about the Psalms. So the Psalms are a collection of 150 poems or songs written between 1500 BC and 500 BC. And most of them were written during King David's lifetime between 1010 BC and 930 BC. And King David is a really key figure in the Psalms. He writes just under half of them, and many of them are almost like a dear diary. It's almost like he is writing a diary entry in which he shares his, his fears, his confessions, his sins. Yet in the midst of this, praises God and articulates his longing to be in God's presence. We see throughout the Psalms that David's reality of the twin tracks is really apparent. Throughout David's life, we see the good and the bad, the joy and the lament. And after Israel's exile to Babylon, these ancient songs and poems, all of these 150 songs and poems were intentionally arranged into what we have in our Bibles called the Psalms. And it's arranged in order to create a story, a narrative that goes beyond each individual psalm or poem. So in order for us to really grasp what the Psalms are about, we need to see it 
as a big picture rather than an individual song or poem. This arrangement splits the book of Psalms into five sections or smaller books. Section one or two talk of the story of David and his family. Section three talks of the tragedy of exile and the downfall of King David. And then section four and five rekindle this hope, a hope for a new king, a new Messiah, a new temple, and for God's kingdom to come post-exile. So we're going to start by looking a little bit at how the writers of the Psalms cling on to the God of the Torah. Throughout the Psalms, we read of people calling out for the faithfulness of God to be seen, the faithfulness of God that they read about in the Torah to be seen in their own lives. As I mentioned a moment ago, the Psalms in places are like the diary entry of the people of faith. As they journey through the ups and the downs and attempted to grasp the nature and the presence of God within their own lives. And for those writing the Psalms, their understanding of God was entrenched in the Torah, their holy scriptures. And we see this really clearly in David's life. Through the life of David, throughout his songs, he consistently points to the God that he has heard about through the teachings of the Torah. He points to the faithfulness of God and asks God, will you show that same faithfulness that brought the Israelites out of Egypt in my life? And as we go through, we start to see that throughout his songs, there are these themes that are parallel themes to those who were putting the Psalms together. Those songs that David writes become so appealing to those hundreds of years later who, remember, were in exile because of Babylonian captivity. So in David's songs, we hear this need for a king and then his response to being anointed as that king. And he gives his thanksgiving and his praise to that. But as you go through, we realise that David is coming to a realisation that his life did not match up with his expectations. Promises that God had spoken to David in the past were not happening in his present. And life was getting rather difficult for David. And this is where he starts to share in these songs his fears, his questions, his worries... He goes into hiding twice as he's being pursued by Saul, who wants to kill him, and then pursued by his own son, who wants his head. And through those songs, we hear agony. And we hear shame uh, portrayed through David through his, because of his committing adultery and having the husband killed. And this leads to a moment of questioning his anointing and questioning God's decision to anoint him. We read Psalms of repentance like this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And we also hear Psalms of lament, like Psalm 13 that starts, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? And these Psalms were used, written by David. They were used in a future generation of people living in captivity to articulate their questions and struggles. And next week, Simon's going to be looking a little bit more at lament and how we can use the Psalms for both lament and praise. Those in exile would have used these to seek comfort. They would have sought comfort from the Psalms as they 
uh, look at God's promises throughout history, especially this promise of the anointed king, a new temple. And as uh, we saw last week, as uh, two weeks ago, when we went through the Psalms, Psalm 2 is wholly focused on this hope for a future king, the future king that is to come. And as you go through the Psalms, later on in the book of Psalms, we start to see a narrative packed of hope for a coming Messiah and thanksgiving to God. Psalms, the Psalms becomes a song, a narrative of hope. Songs that would have been sung as a source of both, of both personal and corporate hope. Songs of hope that became hope of later generations in exile. Throughout the ups and the downs, the good and the bad, the battles and the triumphs, these songs were sung as a way of articulating feelings towards God and hoping for what was to come. The power of singing is fascinating to me. The power of singing to God, just as we did this morning, is fascinating to me. Not only would these songs have been anthems of expression towards God because of the richness and the honesty of them, but put to melody, these would have become memorised and held onto as David and the other writers' personal truths and experiences were lived out through the lives of those following God for generations to come. These songs, as we read the Psalms, we almost need to remember that they were written with melody. They were written as songs to be memorised and held onto for future generations. Songs sung by many different people going through many different life experiences. Songs that were sung to give a source of hope and to help articulate feelings of sorrow and pain. And even Jesus sung these songs as he articulated his lived out experience of following God. The messiness of life alongside the faithfulness of God. There's famous words that Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is a song straight out of Psalm 22. And I want to come on to the magnitude of that in a few moments. There is power in singing out to God, of allowing our songs to be an overflow of expression, an explosion, if you like, of our feelings towards God. And this whole book is a compilation of this. And throughout history, those following God have used this book, these books, these songs, to articulate their own feelings and emotions. There's power in understanding that we are not alone in our feelings, our circumstances, our disappointments, our questions. And for those that were putting the Psalms together in Babylonian captivity, the power of the Psalms was exactly that. The power of the Psalms was that they could look back and say, people have gone through this with God before. And I can get through this with God now. We are not the only people who struggle with these things. We are not the only people who struggle to understand why God is allowing something to happen in our lives. We are not the only people to have doubted God. We are not the only people to have questioned God's faithfulness or goodness. We can see this throughout history. And people have used these questions to help articulate their questions. But the Psalms are so much more than just looking back. 
The Psalms are so much more than just looking back to the past faithfulness of God and the journey of his followers. The Psalms are so much more than a history lesson or a history of emotions. The Psalms also look forward. They look forward in anticipation to a coming Messiah. They extend a promise of this new king, a new king who would come and do everything that the psalmists were longing for, a king who would be the answer, the answer to every prayer, to every song, to every cry shouted out before God. We've got the great opportunity as we read the scriptures from where uh, we are born from our time to have this retrospective hindsight. We can read Psalms in the light of Jesus. Retrospective hindsight, which allows us to read the book with an understanding that there is an ongoing narrative throughout, not just the Psalms, throughout the whole Bible. That scripture is telling a really big, beautiful story that finds its centre, its summit in the person of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is all about anticipation of Christ and the New Testament, the realisation of Christ. Within the Old Testament, the law lays the foundations of Christ. The historical books give preparation for Christ and helps, understand, helps us understand what the absence of God looks like. The poetry, so the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, they look in anticipation to Christ. And the prophecies are the expectations of Christ. So every time we read the Old Testament, we read it in light of Jesus. We read the Old Testament in the light of who Jesus is with this retrospective understanding of Jesus. And because of this, because we can read the Old Testament in the light of Jesus, we can see, we can understand that a greater story is being told. We can take a step back and look at the narrative happening within the pages. It's like when you watch a film and at the end of a film, there's a great big shock. There's a bit of a plot twist that happens right at the end. And you watch it and you think, I did not see that coming at all. And then you watch the film the second time and you think, how is anyone missing this? How is anyone missing this? It's so obvious that this is going to happen at the end. Because when you watch the film the second time, you have this different perspective. You can read it knowing what is going to happen. You approach the film with a totally new perspective. And throughout the Psalms, there are so many of these moments. Throughout the Psalms, there are so many stories that don't seem to directly talk about Jesus. Yet, when the early church reread the Psalms in light of Jesus, with these different tinted glasses, they realised, wow, Jesus is all over these songs. Jesus is all over the Psalms. That this new king that was hoped for was Jesus all along. That even in the cries of pain and the questions, where are you, God? That even in those moments, there was a longing for Jesus. So there is a dual aspect, if you like. Two tracks of the Psalms. A reflection of the experience of the authors and a preview of this greater anointed one, greater than David, able to do the things that David was unable to do. 
And I guess it's probably fair to suggest that this retrospective reading of the Psalms, looking for Jesus within the Psalms, was kick-started by Jesus himself. In Luke 24, verse 44, we read Jesus saying, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus himself is saying that the Psalms must be fulfilled. There is more to them than simply looking back and remembering. But wait a second, Jesus. I thought, I thought the Psalms were just this emotional overflow, this articulation of past followers of God. Instead, Jesus suggests that the Psalms are both written about him and must be fulfilled by him. N.T. Wright says in his book about the Psalms, he says this, the Psalms form the great epic poem of the creator and covenant God who will at the last visit redeem his people and with them his whole creation. A continuous pointing towards Jesus, towards the redemption of the world through the person and work of Jesus. Yet it's only with the lens of Jesus' life that we can clearly see these, uh, the pointing towards him. So where are these pointers towards Jesus in the Psalms? For, for greater grasp of the book, you may have noticed already, but if you haven't, it will become a lot clearer now. I'm not going to be looking at one Psalm in great detail, but instead looking at the Psalms as the, great, the greater picture within the Psalms. So just allow me to skim through a couple of passages so that we can go into greater depth as at what the Psalms are saying as a whole. In the New Testament, the Psalms are quoted. And when the Psalms are quoted in the New Testament, uh, theologians understand these Psalms to be of messianic focus, focused on Jesus. So when they are quoted in the New Testament, most theologians think that they were always about Jesus. In fact, the following Psalms are all understood to be messianic. Psalm 2, 8, 16, 22, 40, 41, 45, 68, 69, 78, 97, 102, 110, 118. Quite a few of these Psalms are understood to be messianic Psalms. A couple of highlights from it. Psalm 41 foreshadows Judas. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. Oh, there it is. Psalm 45 verses 6 to 7, which is quoted in Ephesians with a Christological, a Christ-centered emphasis, says, oh, don't have this one, says, um, when you ascended on high, you took many captives, you received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, that you, Lord God, might dwell there. And Psalm 118, 22 to 23, a more famous quote. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. And there are so many more individual psalms and lines within the psalms which seem to point to the person of Jesus. But if I just went through every single one, it would get a little bit boring. So I don't want to end up just doing that. And also, if we focused on that, we'd kind of miss the greater narrative of the Psalms. The Psalms is a collection of this journey of God's people, of David and of Israel, written in the form of a song, an outpouring of emotion in the good and the bad, wrapped up in hope. Hope for a coming king, even greater than David. And it's the hope in the middle of the messiness that points and longs to Jesus. 
in the cries of difficulty, of suffering. Songs were written that said, where are you, God? Do you really care about me, God? Why have you forsaken me, God? Where is the result of your promises? These cries out, these questions towards God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote this. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. See, Paul would have known the Psalms off by heart. He would have sung these songs throughout his whole life. He would have used them to convey his feelings, his emotions, his questions. Yet in the light of Jesus, in the light of his transformation through Jesus, Paul realises something. Jesus is the hero of the story, of the whole narrative. For every cry, every question, every celebration that we read in the Psalms would be fulfilled in the person of Jesus because every promise of God was completed through Jesus. And this is why I love that in the moment of suffering, Jesus cried out the same cry that we hear in the Psalms. That the followers of God had been crying out before God forever. A song that had been sung by generations of followers of God as they were looking at why their life wasn't matching up to the promises of God. The cry for centuries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus joins in with this cry in his moment on the cross. And in this amazing moment, two things simultaneously happen. And it's something that I hadn't seen before until I looked at it from the Psalms perspective. As Jesus quotes the Psalms in this moment, whether he said it in a cry or whether he sung it to a melody, Jesus is answering the question that has been sung for centuries. Jesus is the answer to his own question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in Jesus hanging on the cross, he says, not only have I not forsaken you, not only am I here because of you, not only is this me showing that you are not forgotten about, showing my radical love for you, even in the midst of the messiness, but also I understand the pain that you are going through. Because I am singing the exact same song that you have been singing for generations. This simultaneous answer to the cries of generations. The proof that God's people were not forgotten or forsaken as he fulfills God's promise and defeats death in this outrageous act of love and grace. And a reminder that Jesus understands our difficulties and that Jesus cares about our pain. And we know this because he went through it himself. He cried out to God in the exact same way that we cry out to God. He cried out to God in the exact same way that those in captivity cried out to God. He cried out to God in the exact same way that for thousands of years, people have been singing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And Jesus validates the feelings expressed in the Psalms. He validates the struggles that we go through and the mess and the difficulties of life. And he steps up and becomes the hero of the book of mess. Another quote, quote from N.T. Wright's brilliant book on the Psalms. The story the Psalms tell is the story Jesus came to complete. It is the story of a creator God taking his power and reigning, ruling on heaven as in earth, delighting the whole creation by sorting out its messes and muddles, its injuries and injustices once and for all. And just like the Psalms, our lives can be pretty messy, full of good and full of bad, full of twin tracks. And the Psalms show moments where people are crying out to God, where are you, God? Yet God doesn't seem threatened by it. Instead, he delights in it. And what makes the psalm so powerful is not that they are a perfect offering, but a truthful offering. And I'm sure we're going to look at that more next week. But even in the middle of the mess of the psalms, the story of life, of experiences, lived out experiences, good and bad, even in the middle of all this, Jesus manages to make the mess a hero story. He manages to fulfill the stories of ups and downs. He shows that he is both the answer and the completion to this transparency and truth. And this should give us hope. This should give us hope and comfort that if he can be the hero of this story full of mess, of thousands of people, singing out to God, if he can be the hero of this story, then he can also be the hero of our story, our story of mess, our story of ups and downs, our story of twin tracks. Jesus is both the hero for the generations gone by and the hero for the generations now and to come. Yes, the psalm gives us a way of articulating our emotions towards God, of giving us words of thanksgiving and praise, and even despair and tragedy. But fundamentally, the narrative of the psalms shows us that there is hope. Hope in all of life. Hope in every situation because Jesus is the hero of our story. He always has been and he always will be. In the messiness of life, Jesus is the hero of the story. If the worship band would come up, that would be great. Why don't we pray? Lord, thank you that you are faithful. Lord, thank you that through generations of people crying out to you, you were always good. God, thank you that you both complete and fulfill the whole of the Psalms, God. And I, I pray that you help us to see that if, if you are the hero of this story of mess, you can be the hero of our story of mess. Will you help us to turn our eyes to you? To see our life with this fresh perspective, this hindsight in the light of Jesus. God, thank you that you are so good and you are so worthy of praise. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Why don't we stand and sing goodness of God?